They always say that to become a good writer, you need to find your voice. That signature style that makes your writing stand out, that identifies you and your work. So my question is, does Akasaka Aka, the author of Kaguya-sama and Oshinoko, have a voice? Does he have a recognizable style as a writer? Because if we take a look at his three main projects so far, the lesser known Instant Bullet, the wildly popular Kaguya-sama, and now Oshinoko, which is currently in the middle of an acclaimed anime adaptation, if we take a look at these three manga, can we really identify a unifying style of storytelling? Because on the surface, they all seem so different. One is a depressing supernatural drama about kids with superpowers and preventing the imminent destruction of the entire world. The other is a fairly standard high school romantic comedy, and Oshinoko has one of the most baffling premises I've ever heard. It doesn't seem as though these three works have that much in common. An uninformed reader probably wouldn't assume they were even written by the same author. So, does Aka have a voice? And if so, how does that voice manifest itself across these vastly different works that cover vastly different genres? It's a simple question. But how do we go about answering that question? Well, today I want to do something a little different. To make this interesting, I propose a kind of critical exercise. I want to see if we can tackle this in a more freeform kind of way, as opposed to the linear, formal approach of your conventional essay. I don't want to go into this with a pre-established structure or overarching thesis. I just want to work my way through these three manga, taking notes, taking a close look at the ideas and themes I come across along the way, and just letting them lead the way, so to speak. Work Working out the connections, the contrasts, whatever may reveal itself to me. And here in this video, I'm just going to lay out my work, the observations I made, the connections I discovered, with no concern for whether or not this will lead me to a conclusive answer to that initial question. Nevertheless, we do need a starting point. And when I look at, say, Kaguya-sama and Oshinoko, there's something that stands out to me immediately, something that pops into my mind. A word, in fact. And that word is love. It's about as vague and universal as you can get, but it is in the title of one of these series, and it's also in the name of one of the main characters in another. And it seems to be at the centre of Aka's brand new manga as well. When reading a series like Kaguya-sama, it seems to me that we're very much in the realm of the kinds of dramatic devices that we would find in, say, Elizabethan comedies and romances, where love is a dramatic motor that engenders misunderstandings, love triangles, mistaken identities, theatrical confessions. It's all about that intricate entanglement of character dynamics and relationships. And the romance of Kaguya-sama very much plays out in a similar way, although obviously dragged out across a much longer timeline and in a more episodic format. And love is certainly at the forefront of at least the first handful of chapters of Oshinoko, but in not so comedic a form. Instead, Ai's story is all about a certain ambivalence towards the concept of love, the illusory love she projects out to her fans, the love she's always been curious about, always wondered if she could ever truly experience, and the love she eventually confesses to her children in her final moments. And already it seems noteworthy to me that both of these stories kind of hinge on a confession of love, but also, perhaps more importantly, the difficulty and the problems of confessing that love. Both Kaguya-sama's main romance and Ai's character arc in Oshinoko find their climactic culmination and catharsis in that confession, that direct expression of feelings that had, up until that point, been locked away, kept secret out of fear. But if we follow the path of love back down to Aka's first major project, Instant Bullet, which I assume is the work of his that most of you will be least familiar with, we find some resistance. Instant Bullet is the story of an alienated high school student who one day finds out that he is one of 20 instant bullets, people with supernatural abilities that may one day either save the world or destroy it. 
And IB is a pretty depressing series, very dark, very pessimistic, and love is certainly not a major part of its vocabulary, but maybe that absence of love can be just as interesting to us in this case, because another word is very much present in this series. The opposite of love, in fact. Well, some may say the opposite of love is indifference, but I'm going to stick with the strong emotions here and say hate. In the very first chapter, the protagonist says it explicitly, I hate this world. And that hatred runs all throughout the manga. It's not subtle. The protagonist wants the world to be destroyed. In fact, he wants to be the one to destroy it. And almost every other character in the series has a reason to hate the world too, and most of them have speeches around that theme of hatred. So right out of the gate, we've identified these two very strong and opposite emotions at the core of these three series premises, love and hate. But that's not really saying much, is it? We're just identifying two very vague concepts. Where things get interesting is when we look at what actually happens to the concept of love in these two manga. How is love dealt with? Going back to that problem of the love confession, we can see that in both cases, love appears almost negatively in its own absence. After all, Kaguya-sama is literally all about two characters who refuse to admit their feelings to each other, and the prologue of Oshinoko is about a woman who, up until her dying breath, had never experienced genuine love in her entire life. Love is a very tricky thing in these two manga, and it's here that we find our first major thematic connection the problem of communication. Because like I said, similarly to Renaissance comedies and romances, Kaguya-sama is built around misunderstandings, miscommunication, the gap between what people say and what people truly think. The manga really emphasizes these familiar dramatic techniques and pushes them to the extreme in order to construct what is essentially a story all about communication. And while in that series it remains fairly intimate, fairly small scale, it concerns those familiar feelings of teenage romance, something we can all relate to. In Oshinoko, on the other hand, the problem of communication is embedded within a plot that's all about modern media, the entertainment industry, the internet, all of these new communication technologies. It's a story that plays out on a much larger scale. But in both of these stories, we find this dichotomy between a character's true self and their public image, the image they project to others, their persona, in other words. In Kaguya-sama, this inability to properly communicate one's feelings leads to the accentuation of a dichotomy between interiority and exteriority. It's impossible to understate how much of this manga's story takes place entirely in the protagonist's minds. It is a profoundly psychological narrative. And we can see this in the arc immediately following the big climactic confession where Kaguya suddenly kind of closes herself off and shuts everyone out, becoming Ice Kaguya. And we spend a lot of time inside her mind with the different facets of her personality. And it's interesting how when you think of a series like Kaguya-sama, you think of the romance, you think of the comedy, you think of it as a light-hearted series, but it does deal with a lot of quite heavy emotional hang-ups. It is an anxiety-inducing series centering on characters who can be very self-deprecating and negative. And the series shows how opening up to other people and building those connections and actually communicating with people honestly can fend off that negativity and self doubt. The bridges we build between ourselves and others make us all stronger. And of course, Kaguya and Shurigane's relationship is only cemented once they truly let themselves be vulnerable, reveal their true selves to one another, and accept that other flawed side of one's personality that we would usually rather keep secret. And we see this in even one of the most apparently absurd story arcs in the series, the freestyle rap episode, which is actually all about communication and indirection, communicating your feelings indirectly through song, which in this story culminates in Hayasaka shedding her mask for the first time and being her true self and finally confronting Kaguya with her true feelings. And Aka's new manga that just started, Renai Daiko, does a similar thing. The characters change who they are in order to become more appealing to the person they like. And of course the joke is that both the boy and the girl are actually getting advice from rival love agencies, and thus neither of them are actually presenting their true selves to the other. 
But always in these stories, the thing that's stopping the characters from building those bridges and communicating honestly with one another is the persona, the masks they wear. It's all about the performances we put on for others. And obviously the notion of performance is integral to Oshino Ko's narrative. This series deals with actors, idols, all different facets of the entertainment industry. At first glance, the reincarnation element of Oshino Ko, while seemingly somewhat arbitrary at first, when you think about it, it does just add another level of interiority, of distance between the protagonists and the world they inhabit. Aka seems very interested in that kind of interiority or alienation, as we've seen with Kaguya-sama, that distance between me and the world, me and other people. In Kaguya-sama, most of the drama takes place inside the characters' minds. It's all about some level of disconnect, some kind of inability to fully reconcile oneself with others, and an inability to close that gap between the real me and the real you, the self and the other. Without the reincarnation premise, Oshinoko would already have been a story about lies, reality, performances, and the media. But the reincarnation element adds one more lie onto the lie. It creates a kind of mise en abime of performances in Aqua's character. Not only is he a teenager performing a role within TV shows and movies and plays, while at the same time hiding his true motivation to find the man who killed his mother, he's also secretly an older man performing as a teenager performing all those roles. It's performance within performance. And most of Aqua's arc is about these thematic interpolations of reality and performance, these constant intricate inversions. In his very first acting role, Aqua gives a great performance by not performing, by simply being himself, because this is a horror movie and he knows that his baseline personality is kind of creepy, so by being real and not putting on a performance, he delivers exactly the right performance. And then again on the Sweet Today adaptation, he brings out the best of the actors around him by saying something directly to the actor he's performing against in that scene, not the character. He says just the right thing to get the right performance out of the other actor. Aqua repeatedly acts by not acting. He performs by strategically deploying reality. So it's not just that Aqua is a character all about these masks, these performances, these lies. He's a character where reality and performance are in this kind of constant dialectical movement. And we see it again when he feels like he needs to wear the Pion mask to speak the truth to Arima, to motivate her. Again, an inversion of truth and performance. He feels like he has to wear a mask, he has to play a role to get through to Arima truthfully. And then again, Aqua is in this stage play where his character's love interest is played by Akane, his real-life fake girlfriend, and his secondary love interest is played by Arima, his real-life, kind of, sort of, real love interest. And by listing all of these things that Aqua has done, all of these performances, we reveal another interesting dimension of Oshinoko's narrative structure. It has an interesting shape to it. To get to the bottom of Ai's death, Aqua has to traverse the world of performance, of entertainment. He agrees to do an acting job to get closer to a potential suspect, then the man asks him to go on a reality dating show in exchange for some information, he gets accepted into a school for entertainers, and then he performs in this stage play because he thinks his father was a part of this acting troupe. There's almost a kind of picaresque quality to it. Those novels were stories where the character would traverse different aspects of a society and thus portraying a kind of satirical vision, a satirical anatomy of a particular time and place. And here we have that kind of satirical dissection of the entertainment industry. Now, while I'm comparing it to a picaresque narrative, Aqua does explicitly frame his story as a revenge play, and to perform this revenge tragedy, he must literally perform on the world stage. Personal drama becomes actual drama, entertainment, becomes intertwined with fictional narratives, media narratives. And in the story, we see examples of Aqua manipulating the media. In order to protect Aruma from a scandal, he strategically exposes his own secret. 
And then, of course, right now in the story, he's working on creating this movie that will presumably expose his mother's murderer, which is very reminiscent of Hamlet's play within the play. So Aqua is this figure who enters into this world, and while he is driven by his quest for revenge, he can't resist helping others and righting wrongs along the way. He traverses various worlds, various areas of the industry, and in each area he perceives a problem that he becomes determined to fix, and fixing the problem usually involves twisting reality and performance, leaning into the media's ability to shape reality and harnessing that power for, well, what he perceives to be the greater good. And sticking with Shakespeare for a second, let's talk about this notion of the world stage. Because this brings us back to Renaissance theatre and the concept of Theatrum Mundi, the world theatre. And this was not an entirely new idea when Shakespeare wrote those famous lines, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players, but many writers have come to associate this understanding of the world as a stage play in which we all play our parts with the Baroque era. Perhaps the most explicit depiction of the underlying philosophy of this idea of Theatrum Mundi, and a quintessential example of Baroque drama, is the play The Great Theatre of the World by Pedro Calderón de la Barca, one of the greatest playwrights of Spain's golden age. In this play, God is depicted as an author who writes the story of the world and assigns the roles to each player, who then act out their parts in accordance with this divine plan. Clearly, in the Baroque worldview, this concept holds religious significance, and at first glance we might look at Oshinoko and think that in this story it has more to do with a critique of the entertainment industry and mass media, and it certainly does, we'll get to that later, but we also have that supernatural element too, and multiple indications that gods are probably involved in this story in one way or another and many readers are already theorising that the characters in the story are actually playing out some kind of divine battle in the human world. And needless to say, this raises questions about fate and determinism, which I'm sure is something that will be explored more and more as we approach Oshinoko's conclusion and the supernatural aspect of the series is clarified a bit more. But it's also very much already present in Instant Bullet. We have a character who can see the future but can't change what's going to happen, and so she must resign herself to her fate. And in this series, fate is also used to address Akka's recurring thematic concern of pessimism versus optimism, about the world, about our place within it, and our relation to other people. It's full of characters who are convinced that they cannot overcome that darkness, the negative aspects of life, and therefore must resign themselves to that fate until someone comes along and shows them that there is the possibility of change. There's even a character in the story who tries to use her power to render humanity infertile so that we stop reproducing, so that we eventually go extinct. She has an antinatalist philosophy. And this reminds me of how Kaguya starts off in that manga. She has a very negative view of mankind, and Shirogane is the one who, consciously or not, pulls her out of that pessimistic worldview. And I think this is where the socio-cultural critique of Akka's narratives comes to the fore. Because after all, this is the world that we must either be pessimistic or optimistic about. So the question arises, what is there to be pessimistic about in our world, according to Aka? Well, I think Oshinoko offers the most explicit critiques of certain aspects of Japanese society, the entertainment industry and mass media, as we've seen. Obviously, we have the critique of idol culture and the stalker-like relationship that emerges out of this industry and which this industry is kind of built upon. We have a critique of social media in the Akane storyline in the reality show. And I think that actually one of my favorite little storylines in the series is when at the beginning of the stage play production, there's this dispute between the original author of the manga that the stage play is adapting and the scriptwriter who wrote the script for the adaptation. The scriptwriter almost gets fired because the original author doesn't like his version of the script. But then we realize that the reason he wrote the script that he wrote 
is because of all these middlemen communicating between him and the original author, and him not having a clear vision of what the author wanted because of that miscommunication. So again, it's a story about miscommunication, but here it's also embedded within this picture of production, the different facets of production, how these things get put together. And of course, the situation is resolved by creating this clear line of communication, this direct line of communication between the original author and the scriptwriter. It's always about these divides, this division, whether that stems from, like we saw earlier, psychological issues, or whether it stems from the different departments of the entertainment industry and production. But even in Kaguya-sama, which is not the kind of story in which we might expect to find any big cultural criticism, there is that fundamental divide between Kaguya and Shirogane, a class divide. It's not just a comedy about miscommunication, about teen psychology, it's miscommunication and interpersonal apprehension between two people on opposite ends of class division. And so we might also read this romance as a story about overcoming that antagonism, rising above it. And while Instant Bullet's story is less grounded in reality, to me it's very reminiscent of the kinds of post-Evangelion manga and anime that some theorists labelled Sekai K. And I've talked about this notion of Sekai K before in my Evangelion video and in my Sunny Boy video as well, I think. Those stories where teenagers' emotional and psychological lives are set against the backdrop of some kind of world-changing, often apocalyptic narrative, and the two are intertwined the personal, the intimate, and the universal, the eschatological. These stories are usually taken to be representative of a certain shift in Japanese culture and society after the burst of the bubble economy in the early 90s. The Sekai K seems to reflect feelings of anxiety and social alienation of a disenfranchised youth in a disconnected world. I'd be very surprised if Akko was not influenced by Evangelion, and in fact, Kaguya-sama is also very much reminiscent of Anno's adaptation of Karekano, those darker, more psychological parts of the story especially. So, what I'm saying basically is that Kaguya-sama is the Evangelion of high school rom-coms. Well, not really, but it is worth noting that the series offers a comedic approach to what are usually very dark themes that almost tragic problem of communication that we so often see dealt with in anime and manga, and was, in a way, probably popularised by Evangelion. It's a serious issue, and it's the thing that's at the core of what makes Evangelion an incredibly depressing series in most people's eyes, and yet here it's the subject of comedy. There's probably also something very telling about the fact that the whole joke of this series is that these interpersonal interactions and problems of communication are framed as battles that are usually won by one of the parties involved. And so in the context of everything we've been discussing thus far, that comedic gimmick, or what appears to be a comedic gimmick at first glance, I think actually is a perfect encapsulation of what a lot of Akasaka Aka's work is about. Human interaction in the modern world, human communication, is a kind of battleground fraught with various psychological or maybe even sometimes physical risks and dangers. To me, all of this points to the idea that Akka's works are always rooted in some kind of interpersonal dysfunction, alienation, a tendency toward miscommunication. Whether it's presented comedically or tragically, there's always an underlying concern for the future of human relationships in a world where there appear to be so many barriers, so many walls erected between people. Those can be psychological, they can be societal, cultural, in Akka's view, these barriers hinder love and engender hate. And it is the purpose of these stories, it seems to me, to dissect those barriers, those internal and external obstacles that prevent people from truly communicating, truly connecting. So there you have it. Now that we've gone through all of that, I can attempt to write a conclusion. 
Upon closer inspection, these three works, which on the surface seem so distant from one another with respect to genre, tone, and structure, actually have a lot in common. And even Oshinoko, which by itself seems a rather eclectic and disjointed story, it's a reincarnation, revenge, tragedy, murder, mystery, critique of the entertainment industry, even Oshinoko, when examined within this larger context, reveals a fairly clear and harmonious vision. And as we approach what seems to be the final act of this tragedy, there's no doubt in my mind that Oshinoko's ending will continue the trend of Aka's previous work of attempting to reconcile the hearts of those lonely players who perform upon the stage of this disconnected world, once again depicting that eternal battle between love and hate, which only ever ends the one way.